Welcome everyone. We're here for the conversation with Mo Scarpelli, the director of El Father Plays himself. My name is Kathy Kalaszewski. I'm the artistic director of Freak Film Festival, and we are really honored to be screening this film as part of the festival and to have Mo here for a conversation about the film. Hey, Mo. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching the film. Oh, it's a marvelous, marvelous film. And I'm, again, really honored that we get to screen it as part of the festival. And then to have you here to have this conversation because there's a lot of layers and a lot of things to unpack in this film. And I'm hoping, you know, to kind of reveal some of your thinking behind the making of this film um, to the audience that, that got the honor to watch it. Um, I want to start off by, by, you know, acknowledging this is a film inside of a film, inside of a story. Um, and there are lots of threads to follow. And I'm just curious kind of how this film came together. Um, you know, was it, was it meant to be a making of, um, uh, you know, a behind the scenes kind of in the heart of darkness, you know, uh, vein, or, or were you intending to be something else? Well, originally it was going to be a making of, but more, less than heart of darkness and more in the vein of Les Blank's uh, beautiful film, Burden of Dreams about Werner Herzog. Yep. working with Klaus Kinski. Uh, um, and it was funny because I remember watching that film with Jorge again before we went back to Venezuela where he was gonna shoot his film and I was gonna make a making of. We decided that I would come along and make a making of. I was gonna come anyway to meet his family because we're actually partners, um, romantic partners. So uh, we do film separately. <laughs> but then I, he was like, oh, maybe you wanna shoot the behind the scenes. I was like, actually, I wanna make a making of. It would be cool to do it like Les Blank's film. So we rewatched the film, but it was really funny because I loved rewatching that movie right before going to Venezuela and thinking about how to source inspiration from it. But um, Jorge was, I remember the end of it looking at him and he was just like terrified because he was like, is, is, is all this stuff gonna happen to me? Like in the jungle, like what happened to Werner Herzog? Anyway, then we got to um, Venezuela. He started shooting the film, but more so his father and I got to know each other. And I found that I was much more interested in these questions I had about Jorge's process with his father. Um, when I first heard about the project, when I first met Jorge, he told me I'm making a film with my dad. He has this crazy past in the Amazon jungle. He's also an alcoholic and I'm going back to kind of reinvent his story. What would happen if he went back to the jungle and met back with those communities and tried to get sober? And I'm like, and he's like, and he's gonna play himself. And of course bells go off for me because as a documentary filmmaker who works all the time in these kind of very precious uh, spaces, they can be precious as you're making the film. Uh, when you're very intimately following someone's life, you kind of hold this uh, control and this power that I find it really important to ask questions about why we have that power and to have like a very solid agreement with the person you're doing it with. And so this just kind of seemed very dangerous, you know, to go back there with his father who he hasn't seen in a while, who this would be the most time they spent together in their lives really consecutively because Jorge left when he was at 15 and he his parents were divorced. Anyway, but mostly that his father would have to, you know, play this role of his own life and play out things that he's not necessarily proud of from the past or face the demons that most of us can just put away and say, oh, that's the past, whatever. So um, yeah, those themes became way more important to me than are they gonna get the shot? Uh, is the, you know, is everything delayed because we lost the location, which happened? Um, is the camera gear, you know, that sunk in the canoe, because that happened. There were many make, you know, things that happened while I was filming the film. But I was so focused instead on this relationship between father and son, because for me, um, it's it, it, it became so necessary to be watching father go through this process and watch Jorge go through this process. I was learning so much about these two men who love each other, but don't know how to express it. And, and we're using this project to do it clumsily, but also very very beautifully in some way. So that's that change. And in that way, Jorge, who, you know, brought me along in his company, his film company said, oh, yeah, sure, you can have a flight and like pay for my stuff. They were all really nice about being like, okay, make the film you want to make. And that was really a joy too, because um, I had ultimate access to everything and decided I could make my own my own version of this without being hired to make a making of and being kind of stuck into that box. So I had a lot of creative freedom in that way. I mean, I'm curious because as you were evolving and you're thinking about how what this film is going to be, how much were you revealing that evolution to Jorge? 
Not at all. <laughs> no, I have this relation. Well, okay, so my relationship with Jorge was different than anything else because like I said, we're partners and he's a filmmaker, so he understands story and all this stuff. And he was trying to give me space with that, just like I was giving him space in his film. You know, we try to just, we made very different things. So we try to respect, um, and, and in fact, if, if whoever saw a father plays himself tonight, wants to see his film, La Fortaleza. It's coming out in the US in cinemas uh, this fall. If you see both films, El Father Plays Himself and El La Fortaleza, it's the same protagonist father, but it's a very, very different kind of way of doing things. So we both know that. And I kind of sometimes had to ask for that space, you know, like don't ask me what I'm, you know. Uh, I wanted him to forget about the camera in a way or to not be preoccupied with it. I didn't want to make what happened in Hearts of Darkness, which sometimes was like, the protagonist speaking to me because I'm the partner. I didn't want that. I don't like making films where the where anyone I'm filming talks to me. I would rather that we. It takes a while, but and but it's this really unique thing that happens when I film with someone that we just have some rules where they're not allowed to look at me, even though they feel me there. And so sometimes it's hard because, like on my last film in Besa, I was a child. He was ten years old, and things were funny, and he wanted to laugh with me, but he had to get used to being, you know, and he did, but in some way it forms this really beautiful thing where they just feel they're being watched and there's a kind of solidarity in that. I formed that with father very, very closely. I'm very close with father because he felt seen by me. I was watching things even when no one else was anymore. I had more patience with him than some other people. I I really felt for him because I I was watch I, I was staying so close to to what who he was in front of my lens. Um, and I care for him of course. I love him so Jorge was a bit different because he's my partner and he's, uh, yeah, that was just, basically it was kind of a struggle to actually get Jorge to, for me to feel like he was not playing a role of some sort and he wasn't doing it on purpose, but it's just a really weird, hard thing to do. And then he got so busy <laughs> with the film. So actually I realized I, I gave a talk recently with some younger filmmakers and they said, what's the biggest advice you have for trying to get your characters to forget about the camera. And I was like, just make sure they're really busy about something that they're really passionate about. Because father and son became so wrapped up in what they were doing that uh, it's not like you always forget the cameras there, but there was a rawness that comes through because they were so focused on something else they were doing. And they totally trusted that I could watch it and I could represent it however I, I saw fit, which was a huge gift for me, so. Well, there's there are two moments because obviously you know, there is a film inside a film and there are moments when you're watching um, the, 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 the fiction version right. but it's through your lens. Um, and so you kind of forget that this is actually real. Um, yeah. And there's that moment where you see you in the mirror mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, oh, there's the filmmaker, not the other filmmaker. And <laughs> then there's the moment when father speaks to you um, where he's he basically acknowledges you and says, oh, Mo, Mo, Mo got the shot that you have been fiddling with for however long and I'm done, right? I'm like done waiting on you. So Mo has it. And so that was that that breaking of that fourth wall for me where I was like, oh, mm -hmm. this is a documentary. Like even though I'm watching a documentary about a making of a fiction film about somebody's life that's a real person, it, it you just, you're kind of, your brain is kind of just like, lost in this this meta world of what you were trying to do um and it, those were the two moments where i was like oh okay this is what i'm watching you know yeah, like yeah and i'm just curious those were deliberate choices right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. brought those into the film specifically for a reason and i want to know what you were thinking especially in the edit room yeah yeah i mean so i worked with an editor who's my soulmate he was incredible I, in many many ways but um his name is juan soto taborda and he's from colombia so he understood all the context of a Venezuelan film crew and the relationship with the family um, because he comes from a similar context. But there was also a lot of learning in that too. So he wasn't so close to this context that you know he couldn't have backed up. But the bigger thing is that Juan is just so intuitive and that he, he and I have this love for cinema that talks about cinema in some way or references that, and that became a theme in the film because it's a film about someone making a film. It's a film that eventually I started to challenge my own uh, you know, arguments that I could make in the past with Jorge sometimes about 
what is more responsible fiction or documentary, what is more responsible to the world and to characters, and what do you get when you say it's a documentary? And I, and I and this film got to really kind of express how uh, beautiful, I guess, that or how how honest that trust is that people come into. To me, this film made me realize how much more. Um, people with when it's a documentary that they walk into it knowing that real that anything could happen in the real sense and there's a there's a respect for that that's very beautiful you know I mean I've watched and I'm making I'm gonna make a film like the next film I'm working on is a fiction with a script but with non-actors and for me it's somewhat hard sometimes to work on it because I'm like what this is very different than um yeah because documentary just it, it has this license to be real and that's what makes it really powerful. But at the same time, sometimes we forget in that realm that what we're watching in a documentary is also a construction. Just like we forget that, I mean, you know this more than anyone because you run the photography at Freep, but in journalism, sometimes we forget if we don't hear the voice of the journalist sometimes, you know, or if we don't, if we don't hear the interview with the photographer who shot this shot, but then he was like, yeah, but behind me was like this, but it's only one photograph, so that's all we could, you know? It's, it's even our perception is, it's a very subjective thing, and it's very, we, we remember things certain ways, all this thing. So cinema is really uh, documentary versus fiction, this idea that one is more true than the other is something I find to be really interesting for us to talk about, you know, and for us to consider in, in, in that, Juan and I wanted to explore what is real and what isn't real in that way. We played with making something, you know, in the fiction and then like, haha, it's actually real, you know? And that doesn't feel right because we find that we love this conversation because it comes from um, something really beautiful, which is the audience trust in the real. So I'm not out there to just entertain, although uh, that's important in films and in storytelling. But I'm out there also to question our perception, you know, and to and to kind of the, this film was such an opportunity to play with those layers. And then there was something really important that happened when Father mentioned my name and said Mo got the shot and all this, which um, which I don't know if everyone picks up on the same way because there's many things happening in that moment. He's choosing me. He's using me to throw me at Jorge. He's, you know, he's mad at Jorge about everything else, you know. But what our favorite thing about that moment was is that very rarely does the character in a documentary, but especially a fiction, exert themselves and say, I choose this film, I choose this way. Mm -hmm. He was in between two films for a long time, for the whole time that we were shooting them. And he was like, I choose the documentary today. <laughs> I don't like all that stuff you're putting up there. I don't like how slow you are. I'm choosing. And I was like, he had autonomy to choose. I find that to be really interesting, you know? And I think that there's ways that we do choose, that our characters do choose what they show us, how they show it to us, da da da. But in this way, it was like literally a man choosing between two films and saying, I prefer this one today for whatever reasons. And, and we found that to be really interesting. It also talks about complicity in cinema and, and the character's point of view. I mean, that, that opens kind of a, a whole other avenue for exploration um, because there are a lot of moments in this film where there are um, there are tensions and there are, um, I mean, for me, you know, really uncomfortable moments where where you're showing father in a in a situation that may not be from an outsider's view the most flattering, you know, and no, this yeah. idea of how far do you push, you know, not only in from from a from a from the narrative standpoint, you know, and I'm sure these are things that Jorge he was wrestling with, I would imagine, and what you were wrestling with, you know, when the scenes when, when, you know, when he's very intoxicated, you know, mm -hmm. or when there's, you know, trying to get him to a place that will get him to a scene that there's a lot of emotion or, or, you know, really an expressive scene that, that almost feels exploitive. Um, right. I'm just right. curious what, what was going through your mind when you were watching that, as well as kind of playing that out in the edit as you're thinking about shaping this story. Yeah, this crazy cyclone of these two, I learned so much about Jorge too, you know, like 
why he wanted to work with his father was very intuitive. He had to fight for it because as you saw in the film, the producers didn't always want him to be there and they thought, oh no, you should work with an actor, you should do this safer. But Jorge Jr. is very intuitive and, I, and in the reason it turns out that I think both of them even wanted to work with each other is that they know they can push each other further and that they feel alive by that. Mm -hmm. that, can, that can also be dangerous um, emotionally, especially for these two very sensitive men, actually very sensitive men who then end up in the cyclone together, pushing each other off a cliff, <laughs> you know? And so I was worried watching it. Sometimes it was very hard to watch or to keep filming. Yeah. Um, but the weirdest part is that there were, I mean, for me, the pushing or the continuing to film uh, and be present, because if I turn the camera off, I would be showing father, especially father, because he was so used to me with filming everything. Mm -hmm. I would be showing him that I wanted him to put the brakes on anything. And it wasn't my job to tell father that. It wasn't Jorge's job either. It was father's job and Jorge, but they were working something out between them that was very intimate and too crazy for some people to watch. And Jorge's set would leave the set. Um, but it was, it was hard to film some things because I just felt it was it was taking things really far in a way that emotionally I didn't know if they would be able to survive it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, they both did it. And I learned this by the end because at some point uh, in the early parts of the shoot, Actually, it was when we filmed the really tough scene to watch where her father's pounding on the barrels and he's doing the cell phone call. That was so, that was so emotionally like heavy. Uh, and I worried about father's state after that. And Jorge also said, I hope me and my dad make it through this. You know, that was only halfway through his film. Um, but they both had been pushing, you know. Anyway, um, but the interesting thing is that by the end, what I learned is that these two have so much more trust in each other than, than I ever really understood. They never really believed they would go too far because they, they, know, they know how to read each other enough okay. and they know how to bounce off of that, you know, and defend each other. And so it's really interesting because uh, it took me a long time to get to know that because there's, you know, especially father can take things so far, but he only takes them so far because he knows where he wants, kind of wants it or, because he's kind of trying to teach him to be, you know, stronger or to be more raw because he thinks the real is better or he's trying to express himself. But either way, they could express each, each, themselves to each other in this strange way where they use the movie to do it. Um, but a lot of it was based on this huge trust they have with one another. Um, so ex exploitation went through my head for sure while I was filming that, that word and that, that issue. But I have to say that at some point it became very irrelevant, this idea of exploitation, because I started to learn how these two were like care for each other and they would never ever exploit one another in the final product of the thing. And they never did it really on set. As much as things got intense, it was always that they were both complicit with how things got. Um, so yeah, so that was, that was a, uh, but you know, the line gets pushed and all these ways, the lines get all moved. It was, it was quite a, intense experience of worrying about this kind of exploitation. I think it's actually though, it, it taught both of them a lot about where to be sensitive with, you know, with other people about their emotions, you know, um, in their work. And so, um, yeah, I don't know how to describe that, but. <laughs> well, I mean, and I think, I mean, some of it that, what struck me is, you know, the separation and from, moving to Canada at 15 and then coming back and this idea of kind of trying to rekindle, you know, rediscover, you know, reconnect with, with your, your parent, your father. Um, one, I think it's probably, you know, um, fathers and sons have a very unique relationship. Um, it's evident obviously in, um, in some of the home movie footage that's, that's in the film. Um, mm -hmm. and it's used very effectively, but I also, I'm curious because if it was a journey of discovery, do you, do you feel like they've, they learned something about them, each other in the process? And, and if, if so, what, what do you think that they learned from each other? Yeah, I think they learned multitudes. I mean, when we left Venezuela after the shoot, it was very, hard time because everything, it felt like everything had been ripped, like all the band-aids had been ripped off these these two guys and I had watched all of it. And so we were really worried about how Father's Day like, would be because he was still drinking sometimes. And I was worried about Jorge because he fell apart afterwards emotionally. Um, 
and it was like, okay, everything is kind of suspended in the air. Like what's going to happen? Because you made this thing as a cinema that could kind of be therapy if you wanted it to, but then it was done in your, when your dad's style, which is like, you know, like I said, jumping off a tapui or off a cliff. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, like this, any, this could go anywhere. The film, it, I mean, they definitely became closer making the thing, but with distance, they became, they reminisced about things that they did together. Um, we eventually, we brought the films to show father like later in the year after we edited them, he watched both. And then the next year after Jorge's uh, premiere, which also went really well, where father came to Rotterdam where it premiered and he was like, wow, people aren't seeing me as a character, like as a real person in this film. It's like, it's not that sensitive. Everyone thinks I'm just acting a fake story. Like that was really nice for Jorge's fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was a bit, he wasn't nervous about the documentary because he was like, no, it's raw. It's what it's supposed to be, you know, um, and I can handle it and da, da, da. But he was, um, he had a lot of undeveloped kind of feelings about what had happened and un kind of all of us, I think had, we weren't sure if, if the, all this filmmaking together was going to bring us all together or maybe be something that was a really crazy memory. That's the potent emotionally, but kind of hard to unpack. Mm -hmm. What happened was the opposite because father ended up going into a rehabilitation center after Jorge's film premiered. And he went to a center who wanted to, once they found out there was a documentary, which father had seen and had said, yes, I support the documentary. Like, wow, it was hard for him to watch his son's face sometimes, you know, and see himself was like, whoa. But then his therapist after six or eight months at this, at this center said, can we watch the documentary? And he said yes, and he shared it with them. And then he ended up watching it a lot. And he watched La Fortaleza and the documentary with his therapist, you know, not drinking and sobriety, like in the mountains outside of Caracas. And he, I mean, we did a conversation online, actually. We recorded one, and it's, and if you go to Father Plays Himself, we're putting it there, uh, .com, it's, we're putting it up there soon. Um, but it's, it's like uh, where I kind of interview him about how he feels now, and he has, used, he chose, you know, it's not that my, my film is amazing. It's that I made the film I made, but my, my but a father chose to use it to, to try to see how he was or how he could be and what beautiful things he did and what really harmful things he did to himself and his son. And so it's really interesting now because Jorge and father are closer than ever before. Um, even before they were using our father in the, in the therapy and stuff like that, there was this kind of, yeah, it was it was slowly by slowly the both the films were becoming something that they yeah that they were talking about more on the phone and that Jorge was revealing things he was scared about too reflecting back on them. So I'm just like thank God that it was actually used that way because it didn't have to be. Not all cinema ends up being the best for people who aren't ready to look at it that way. And I'm really proud of Father for not just being in both films because that I'm sure was insanely hard, <laughs> but for then at, at, at the end using it, you know, using the cinema both different films to try to, to, I don't know, to try to keep provoking uh, how to be a, a human being, you know, how to be the person you want to be, or I find that really admirable. Um, you talk about kind of therapy and in a lot of ways, um, you know, good therapists, they're really good at reading body language and your film is very good at capturing body language. There are just multiple um, moments in the film, just a, a, a raise of an eyebrow or a shift of a head or, you know, just lingering on, on somebody with their back to the camera, you are communicating all this emotion. I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't know if it's a stretch to say like, you know, therapy through filmmaking, but there was, there was definitely elements of kind of reading the body language and understanding this silent communication that was happening internally probably in their heads and then to each other um, mm -hmm. um, in those di different scenes. And I'd be curious because this is kind of a two-part question um, because it's a technical one. I'm a photographer by trade. So, right. you know, you're, you're looking at a movie set and there are all these pieces and all these, this crew and there's lights and all this stuff. And then there's just you in the background um, capturing all of this. So one, trying to avoid, uh, being a part of the movie set while at the same time, um, you know, t having the patience um, to kind of just sit and be with this, the, the characters in your, your movie, like what was the process for that? How were you shooting? What, what were you thinking about? Were you deliberately thinking about these quiet moments or are they just 
like unfolding or is it just something intuitive to you as a filmmaker? I've, I've, I've seen, you know, two of your other films. And so I feel like there's that cinematographer and you knows how to be patient and wait. You know, and I learned with, that from photography. <laughs> yeah. I want to get you to expound on that. I don't mean to yeah. be talking all about it. I think you probably have real insight into that. I'm thinking I should move though, because I'm a bit dark. No, I didn't realize that the light would completely leave my face. Am I too dark to see? I think you're okay. I'm okay. Okay. Because I. I'm, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I'm just on a big bank of windows in front of me, so. Okay, because <laughs> I can't really like see myself on, okay, maybe that'll help. Um, yeah, body language is primary thing I shoot with actually. Um, in my first film, we used interviews and uh, we were in a lot of very kind of tense situations where people would react to this or that, but really it was an Mbesa, the, the, my, my first solo directed film that I, I focused so much more on body language. Part of it was because that film was set in Ethiopia with a kid speaking all Amharic um, and so actually I didn't understand most of what he was saying, which was good. Like I didn't really need to, that's kind of why I filmed with him is that I felt like he was very intuitive and it was easy to kind of fall into his expressions and, and just look like, you know, project myself into them and just follow his expressions more than words. He's a kid too. So it's different. And he's a kid, a few words, but a lot of power, but with these guys, it's, it was definitely body language was super important. Part of me, maybe a week or two into Jorge's shoot, I was worried. I mean, I shot a lot of stuff in Caracas of them preparing, da, da, da. But I was worried, are these little things gonna translate? Um, because in, in the past, in Embesa, I did have some moments where the kid hardly, real, you know, a tiny raise of an eyebrow and, and the, you know, I would have it in the scene and people would be like, I don't know, I didn't see it, you know, like not necessarily see it. So it's not always that it works. But I think when I'm, as a cinematographer, I move a lot, like I shoot handheld and I move a lot with, and I listen always to the microphone of the character that I'm following. So I hear their breathing and, and you know, when they're tense, I'm like, I'm, I feel like I'm moving with them, with their energy and with their body language. So I'm more kind of in line with their body language and maybe even sometimes tuning out what they're saying. Um, because, and then in other times, you know, to tune out what they're, not tune out what people are saying, but there were time, there were definitely many moments more than ended up in All Father Plays Himself that I shot and could tell that that father was upset because of the way he was speaking or how his anxiety that day, I felt this bubbling up something. And I just had to remain there. And then he would talk about how he, you know, got lunch later about Jorge, I don't know, something stupid, but it's not, it, it, it was not something, it was not about what, it was, it's never about what is said. It's always about how it's said. And that's actually a huge part of family relationships anyway. I think that we fight with our family about like what crayon to use from the moment we're little kids, you know, up until, you know, what bed who's gonna stay in over Christmas, like when you get old, I don't know. Just we fight about all kinds of stupid things, but actually they can get really intense because we have such a historical knowledge of that person. So I was I was waiting for these little moments. It didn't matter, I mean, when, okay, so they fight in the film because father hurt his finger. Uh, that was one of many things that they're fighting where I'm like, it's not about the finger. But the funny part is even today, Jorge and father are like, well, you know, I didn't even really break the finger. Well, no, he did break it. They still fight about the finger. It's like, they don't even see that. It's like, it's not about the finger. You guys are so mad about so many other, like about who has what power, you know, in the film and representation and the his your history and that Jorge wasn't there. You know, I'm seeing all that because I'm watching them, but they, so anyway. That's a very beautiful part of filmmaking because if you if you have the opportunity to watch someone who says, yes, watch me as much as you want, like go ahead, no holds barred. You have the opportunity to really sink into body language in this, like it's into a place of observing just how delicate human beings are, you know, like just, and that, that's a huge privilege. That's my favorite thing about, about making films is, is getting to a, sp a, a kind of space with someone where I can, yeah, where, where I have the opportunity to just watch what happens on their face when someone says something, because we always betray ourselves, you know? But usually if we're not recording it or we're not listening like I'm doing here, we may let it pass or we may forget about it. Or we're too busy reading so that we can decide how to react. 
And as a cinematographer, as a, as a director of the of documentaries, I get to just watch and not worry about giving body language back and reacting and, and having that street. So it's a huge, it's, it's a, it's a crazy kind of um, relationship that I form with my characters where I feel very, very close to them. And even if we, you know, talk about my life later, I'm like, you don't even know what I feel towards you, you know, then they watch the film later and they're like, Oh my God, you were there. And you, Whoa, you know, it's kind of strange. <laughs> You talk a little bit about family, and obviously, um, the Freak Film Festival focuses on um, on Michigan stories or Michigan storytellers, and your roots are here. Mm -hmm. um, there was a story in the in the Big Rapids paper um, when El Father Plays Himself uh, had its premiere. I'm, tell me a little bit about kind of your Michigan roots, and and what about growing up in Michigan has inspired you and kind of formed you as a filmmaker and a storyteller. Yeah, I was born in Lansing. My mother is from Grand Rapids. My dad's from Chicago. And uh, so then, then we moved around actually a bit. We went to Louisiana and Virginia. We came back though, and I went to high school in Big Rapids where my family has a small radio station. My dad's dream of his life is to buy a small business. And he saved up in these times moving around and, and bought this radio station in Big Rapids. And the family became like the people, I mean, we, he had employees for real, but he also, we would work there as, as kids, like in high school. And so, yeah, I remember this, like my biggest assignment ever that I assigned myself because my dad was like, oh yeah, you can do stuff for the, it was a commercial, it is a commercial radio station. It's not necessarily like a public radio or like news, but they had news in the morning. I was like, I'm going to go do news reports. This is before I went to journalism school and university after that. And so I remember uh, when Gerald L. Ford died, there was a big funeral procession and everything in Grand Rapids. There was a big, big um, ceremony. But also there were a lot of little pockets of things in East Grand Rapids in his old neighborhood. So I basically, I just like drove down there from Big Rapids with my tape recorder and my microphone and went around and just interviewed people about memories they may have had during his, you know, while he was there as a young person or, or what they thought of him or, uh, and it was, it was beautiful. That was maybe the first kind of documentary ish project I did. I think I was 17 or something. Um, but I just remember how forthcoming people are, especially when it's not video, actually, it's even more honest, like really fast when it's just audio. But I just remember what a gift that was, you know, for people to share their experience with me and, and be really open. And then I went to university in, in Missouri and I kind of had some of that openness, but then I went to New York and the people are very open in New York, but not the same, you know, like this is like a kind of very humble, like, I think that that's the thing I love about Michiganders is that I can always tell them from their accents, <laughs> but I can always kind of tell from their humility, you know, and, and I find it like, you know, I'm, I live in Italy now and I was like on the Amalfi coast and I overheard someone and was like, wow, that sounds like Michigan to me. And the guy like found out I was from Michigan too. And it's like, Hey, and then he started talking and I was just like, I'm like on this coast of Italy, but I'm like, I'm at home, you know, I feel home. <laughs> so I have this very beautiful place in my heart for Michigan. And I thought about going back and making a film about my own family after doing this one on the a father um, with the radio station and some ideas that I had, but, um, but I don't know if I'm ready to make a film about my own family, to be honest. I think it's a very difficult thing to ask your family to do unless they're 100% on board and my family is a bit more shy about that kind of thing. So uh, maybe I can make an audio documentary about them. <laughs> Humble Midwesterners, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a thing. Um, and, and it is, it's tough uh, to ask your family to kind of lay themselves bare for you, you know, right. which is why this film is, is, is so, glorious because you know you you do um you do honor and respect people who will do that for you uh mm -hmm. and you can actually learn and, and reveal something back to the audience in a way that they may not have even expected you know right. um right. so uh I, I would be remiss in not um mentioning and talking a little bit about um uh about your film from afghanistan um, right. We had a small email exchange a couple of weeks ago um, and uh, wanted to kind of hear, you know, uh, uh, a little bit about those characters for, 
for those in the audience that don't know, I mean, your film Frame by Frame was about the fall of the photographers after the fall of the Taliban um, and um, this opportunity for photojournalists to kind of document and tell the stories of what was happening in Afghanistan because during the Taliban, it was completely forbidden. Exactly. You follow uh, a couple of photojournalists, um, you know, as they kind of navigate through this, this new media freedom. Um, and obviously the last couple of weeks has been, um, you know, really shocking uh, for, for many uh, watching it unfold mm -hmm. on TV, but also from those who know what it's like to be a journalist inside. Um, I imagine, um, you know, this is a, it's a story unto itself. So I'm just curious if you've heard from your, the folks that you followed and, and what is the status, if you know, of, mm -hmm. of life as a journalist inside of Afghanistan right now? It's not good, the status. Um, basically, the, the film follows four characters. One is a Pulitzer, the first and only Pulitzer Prize winning photographer from Afghanistan, Masoud Husseini, and he left Kabul uh, maybe like a week before the airport shut down. He was on a flight to, basically there's an organization in Holland that has been supporting his mental health like and mental health of many photographers in conflict zones they invite them to come stay with them for some time and they offer them support if anything happens so they helped him uh basically have support and now he's living in in holland and trying to figure out what to do uh next farzana wahidi the female character and wakil uh the another younger photographer they are both in afghanistan still uh in kabul um, Wakil now works for the AFP. He has Masood's old job that he had. To, so he's a stringer. He's a he's mm -hmm. a photo photojournalist who's always probably if you if you follow the news in Afghanistan and you've seen the Detroit Free Press or the New York Times like pictures from Afghanistan from the last five years that are coming off of the wire, you're probably seeing Wakil's photographs. So he's really since frame by frame, his career has gotten really successful. But the weird thing about saying successful is that pits conflict photographers in a place where they need to stay in conflict zones to be successful. And he's like, no, I'm staying. So we're in touch on, on Facebook and uh, by WhatsApp, but he's he's not thinking of leaving, you know? He's like, I will stay here. I'm gonna document this. He also lived through a lot of the, the war um, before, during the civil war, before the Taliban came to uh, power. Um, so he remembers the Mujahideen versus the Taliban and being in the midst of that in Panjshir Valley and walking over mountains to get to Pakistan. So, and then the older gentleman, uh, the teacher character, he's in Toronto. So basically, what I'm saying is, two of the four characters are now outside, mm -hmm. trying to vie for you know support for people inside. Uh, but the journalists themselves have been publicly targeted targeted by the Taliban for a long time, and then it's been reiterated in this last couple of weeks. So it's a very dangerous uh, situation. Both Wakil and Farzana, I mean, Farzana is in, incredible. She lived in Kabul for everything since she was born um, and became the most renowned female photographer in Afghanistan and one, one of the most renowned photographers, period. And she feels very convicted that if she leaves, especially with the Italian, or with Italian, the Taliban in power now and their horrendous record of abuse on women, and what she went through having been beaten by a Taliban member before as a child, as a girl, for being a woman. She can't leave because she her work is centered around the voices of women that no one hears from. And she has that trust and she's the only one who can do that kind of work. And the sad thing is when we made the film and it came out in 2000, we made it in 2000, we shot it in 2013 mostly. It came out in 2015. At that point in 2013, in an interview in the film, she says, I'm the only one who can do this work, unfortunately, right now. And I hope it's not the case. But she's now, then by 2015, when we released the film, we went to some festivals with her and she said, no, I don't think it's the case anymore. You know, there's more of us. But now that things are happening so fast, the way they are, she's back to being, feeling like she's the only one who can do it. And so that is something that is beautiful, her passion for it, but it's also very tragic because of all the work that the country's done to try to get beyond that, you know. It's very quick that it goes away. So, well, that, yeah. Well, that film, you can you can catch it streaming, right? It's uh, Yes, it's, that film, they actually, the distributors, unfortunately, were very, <laughs> it, it, 
it's on iTunes. <laughs> they were they were supposed to put it out in many places, but the film is right now it's only available on iTunes. So if you look for frame by frame film, if you Google it, you'll see that it's streaming on iTunes. And they lowered the price recently so that they could just try to get more people to watch. Um, so yeah, if you if you look for the film there, or you can send me an email and I'll send you the film if you can't find it because it's kind of hard to find things on iTunes actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would encourage anybody watching this, um, and if you're a fan of El Father Plays himself, that Frame by Frame is an important film and one that should be watched and put into the context of kind of what is happening now culturally and, and in the news today. Um, overall, I can't thank you enough. Um, this has been such a great conversation. I've really appreciated you and this film and your you know participation in the festival, and I'm looking forward to what you've got coming, if it's a film about your family or something down the line. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep talking because um, we're just, we're a fan. And, and, and thanks again for being a part of the festival. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>